Hi, I recently attended a live event in London with Stephen Bartlett, where he shared some practical tips on business and life. So in this video, I'm going to share some of the main takeaways that I learned from that event and how you can apply them personally to your own life to increase your own chances of success and fulfillment. He started the event with an analogy where any kind of long-term pursuit or goal can be best thought of as an upward climb towards the peak of a mountain. For many of us, we're at the start of the journey, and this is base camp. But as you start to gain some traction and momentum, you might start that upward climb and you're a part ways on the journey, which is growth. Then for the minority of people who persevered through the challenges and the difficulty, they've reached the top of the mountain, which is the summit. And here it's sort of a blessing and a curse because by definition you're at the top of the mountain which means there's no further that you can go which means at this point onwards it's either going to be at best maintaining the top of the mountain but it could also and very likely to be a more of a downward decline from this point onwards. After the summit we start the decline and this is where we start to quit some of the things that no longer matter to us or we've already realized our potential in the areas that we tried so we start to kind of ease off the tension, ease off the accelerator and direct our attention to often more meaningful but less career based objectives. Then finally we have the bottom of the mountain and this is death which sounds rather bleak but you'll see as we come to the end of the video why this ties in nicely with the rest of the journey. So if you're at the start of the journey or you've began that upward ascent towards growth then probably the biggest blocker that you've come across is a lack of motivation or how to find motivation when it starts to get challenging. So Stephen defines motivation as expected value minus expected loss. So if the kind of things that you're trying to do outweighs the negativity that you get from it then you will have sufficient motivation. This is why if you don't actually care about the goal that you're pursuing, it will eventually fizzle out because the friction involved and the difficulty and challenges will be the loss and this will be higher than the value that you actually think that you're going to get from it. One important side note that he made is that often we need three times as much value to offset the same amount of loss. This is due to the psychological concept called loss aversion and a good way of thinking of it is that imagine you had 20 pounds or 20 dollars in your pocket but you suddenly lost it. The amount of negative emotion that you experience from losing something is a lot more than if you found a random 20 dollars or 20 pounds on the street. So what this means in practice is you have to find ways either to increase the value or decrease the loss and to increase the value you either need a very strong reason why you're doing something or you have a bunch of complementary smaller reasons that all add up to something more meaningful. In terms of decreasing the loss as I alluded to this could be either reducing the friction it takes to get something done so imagine you want to go to the gym and your goal is to get fit then one of the ways to reduce friction is to make the whole process of going to the gym a little bit easier. Obviously loss can come in many different forms from financial loss to loss of time or energy but usually if you can kind of pool your resources or increase your leverage it saves in a lot of these different areas. The next concept he introduced is the idea of the five buckets and depending on how full each of those buckets are will heavily determine your likelihood of success down the line. The buckets are knowledge, skills, network, resources and reputation and one of the important things to know is that the order of these actually matters. But in particular the first two are very core and foundational to who you are and what you have to offer as it's very difficult to take these away from you. In life your network is always changing, resources come and go and your reputation is very much dependent on other things so this is also quite a dynamic quality. Stephen's general advice is that you should try to fill the buckets in the correct order because doing so means that the next bucket you have more leverage to be able to fill that one. So when it comes to developing skills there's this idea called skill stacking and it's important to know because often when we're trying to pursue something we assume that we have to be the best in the world at everything related to that but that's just not true. When we look at someone like Cristiano Ronaldo who's one of the best footballers of all time we often assume that he must be the best in every area of football but that's actually not the case. He's not the best penalty taker or free kick taker or the fastest player or the best dribbler and many other areas too but he is in the top 10% in nearly all of these categories. So the takeaway is to not try to become the very best in one very niche area, 
Instead, try to find complementary skills and become above average or ideally in the top 10% in each of those skills and this will combine and compound into something that is truly worthwhile. The next is when it comes to social skills, but particularly in a business setting where you're trying to appeal to certain people's interests or get them on your side and try to work with them or form some kind of partnership or deal, then one thing to bear in mind is the idea of the RICE method. RICE is an acronym where R is reward, I is ideology, C is coercion, and E is ego. If you can utilize some combination of each of these four things, it will massively increase your chances of winning someone over. But the order again also matters, so it's important to be aware of which things actually apply the most and which ones you should only use to a small extent. So it turns out ideology comes first. If you can appeal to someone's ideology, then it's a very powerful tool. Next though is ego. After that, it's reward, and coercion should be used very lightly, as this can have negative long-term effects if you overdo this particular quality. A good example of ethical coercion is let's say you met a celebrity at an event and you wanted them to stay behind afterwards to sign autographs, you might kind of imply that you've come a long way and that you've got friends and family who've traveled a long distance in order to be here. So it might play on their compassionate side, but again, it's very important that this type of coercion is done honestly. So the next lesson is the whole idea of a company. And when we think of companies, we often put a very corporate perspective on it and we think of them as a multi-million or billion dollar franchise or industry where they're making a huge amount of money. But in reality, a company is just a group of people. When you think about it, it makes sense because without the people inside the company, then the company wouldn't actually make any money and therefore the success and prosperity of the company is heavily dependent on the types and the quantity of people within it. So when you view things through this lens, then it becomes obvious that as a founder or CEO, the main thing that you have to worry about is good recruitment. The three lessons or steps towards excellent recruitment is one, try to find the best people you possibly can. Two, bind them under one really good culture where the sum of the parts exceeds the individual units. So one plus one equals three. And then three, unite them under a shared vision or mission, which really gives everyone a deep sense of purpose. So the next lesson or concept is to paint the back of the fence. And this is taken from Steve Jobs, where when he was young, he was taken by his father and was shown that it's very important to paint the back of the fence, even though you're not gonna see it and no one else will. What this means in practice is that the people who do really well have an amazing attention to detail. And one of the things that determines their success is the fact that they care about the things that most people think wouldn't actually matter. This has lots of other benefits too, such as marginal gains. So if you try to improve lots of little things over time, they compound to something very big, which is evident from the British cycling team, which used to underperform and not do very well, but because they started taking interest and caring about the small stuff, over time they became regular winners. Psychologists have also shown that one of the things that motivates and fulfills us is that sense of going somewhere or forward progress. So whatever you decide to pursue, if you can continually improve things by 1%, over time that 1% will start to compound with the other 1% and it ends up being something that's night and day from what you ended up starting with. The other byproduct of this is that if you keep doing this, you end up making these little promises to yourself and if you can keep them, then it actually strengthens your willpower, it strengthens your self-esteem, because by keeping the promises that you make to yourself, you know that you're the kind of person who can achieve the thing that you're aiming for. The next idea is that of failure. And I've actually made a video on failure fairly recently, so I'll link that down below. But in reality, failure is not the antithesis of success, it's the prerequisite for success. So your future successes are heavily influenced by the relationship you have with failure. So if you're able to embrace failure and to iterate and learn from those failures, then this means over the long term, you will end up having more information to go by than most other people and most of your competitors. As they say, failure is just an opportunity to learn. So if you're able to fail faster, then you will accumulate more data in the long term, which will aid you towards the kind of thing that you're aiming for. 
The next thing was sort of a case study on the kinds of people who become leading experts or at the forefront of certain technologies. And one of the things that they tend to have in common is that they're all able to embrace innovation and change and lean into the things that most people dismiss or are skeptical over. If you think about it, if you see someone who's very emotionally charged but skeptical over something, then it's often a sign that they're not willing to embrace some kind of innovation or change. Even if it doesn't actually go somewhere, the fact that they were so dismissive of it means that they're often going to be the kind of people who are stuck in the past or in retrospect, the kind of people who end up being massively wrong over something. There are so many examples and clips online where you can see people who really didn't think it's possible that the internet would become the thing it is today. The same is true with AI or social media. So if you see something that's popping up, this could be something to lean towards because if you're there at the start and are one of the early adopters, then you're gonna have the most amount of opportunities to actually make something of it. And a good example of this is with cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin. So just as it's very important to know what to start, it's also very important to know when to quit. Because if you fail to quit the things that are not actually going anywhere or don't really have potential, then you're only going to end up wasting your time, energy and even money. But by far the biggest time waster is not bad decisions, it's indecision. It could be indecision in quitting something that you should quit, but more likely it's indecision about how to get started in something that you actually want to pursue. And now we have the bottom of the mountain, which is death. And I know it sounds a little bit bleak, but the reason why it's important is because viewing things through this lens really puts into perspective the kinds of things that you should care about and how to place your time, energy and money. The analogy that Stephen goes with is the casino of life. And we all have a predetermined amount of casino or poker chips where each chip corresponds to either one hour or one day, depending on how you like to look at it. A portion of these chips will be used for sleep, a portion of them will be used for work and many other activities. So when you actually go through this, it becomes more apparent that we have a finite number of chips to use and how we use them will influence how much fulfillment we get, but also how much success and joy we get overall. But if there's one thing for sure, then the best investments that you can make is to invest in good people. And this could be friends, family, romantic partners, business partners. So much of your life satisfaction will be based around the kinds of people who you hang around with. So it's good to get this part right and pick these people wisely. So that's all for this one. I hope you found it useful. If you did, then feel free to like, subscribe, leave a comment down below. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.